Hey, fourth grade, we are ready to start chapters five and six of our book, The Series of Unfortunate Events. Before I read, I just want to give a special thanks to Scholastic because they're the ones who are letting me read this book out loud to you guys and videotape it so you guys can watch it while you're at home. So chapter five. That night felt like the longest and most terrible the Baudelaire orphans had ever had. And they'd had plenty. There was one night shortly after Sunny was born that all three children had a horrible flu and tossed and turned in the grasp of a terrible fever while their father tried to soothe them all at once, placing cold washcloths on their sweaty brows. The night after their parents had been killed, the three children had stayed at Mr. Poe's house and had stayed up all night too miserable and confused to even try to sleep. And of course, they had spent many, many, many a long and terrible nights living while living with Count Olaf. But this particular night seemed worse. From the moment of Monty's arrival until bedtime, Stefano kept the children under his constant surveillance, a phrase which here means kept watching them so they couldn't possibly talk to Uncle Monty alone and reveal that he was really Count Olaf. And Uncle Monty was too preoccupied to think that anything unusual was going on. When they brought in the rest of Uncle Monty's purchases, Stefano carried bags with only one hand, keeping the other one in his coat pocket where the long knife was hidden. But Uncle Monty was too excited about all the new supplies to ask about it. When they went to the kitchen to prepare dinner, Stefano smiled menacingly at the children as he sliced mushrooms. But Uncle Monty was too busy making sure the stroganoff, so stroganoff sauce didn't boil to even notice that Stefano was using his own threatening knife for the chopping. Over dinner, Stefano told funny stories and praised Monty's scientific work. And Uncle Monty was so flattered he didn't even think to guess that Stefano was holding a knife under the table, rubbing the blade gently against Violet's knee from, for the entire meal. And when Uncle Monty announced that he would spend the evening showing his new assistant around the reptile room, he was too eager to realize that the Baudelaire simply went up to bed without a word. For the first time, having individual bedrooms seemed like a hardship rather than a luxury, for without one another's company, the orphans felt even more lonely and helpless. Violet st stared at the paper tacked to her wall and tried to imagine what Stefano was planning. Klaus sat in his large cushioned chair and turned on his brass reading lamp, but was too worried to even open a book. Sunny stared at her hard objects, but didn't bite a single one of them. All three children thought of walking down the hall to Uncle Monty's room and waking him up to tell him what was wrong. But to get hit to his bedroom, they would have to walk past the room in which Stefano was staying. And all night long, Stefano kept watching, in a ch kept watching a chair placed in front of his open door. When the orphans opened their doors to peer down the dark hallway, they saw Stefano's pale, shaved head, which seemed to be floating above his body in the darkness. And they could see his knife which Stefano was moving slowly like a pendulum of a grandfather clock. Back and forth it went, back and forth, glinting in the dim light, and the sight was so fearsome they didn't dare try walking down the hall. Finally, the light in the house turned to the, turned the pale gray, blue-gray of early dawn, and the Baudelaire children walked blearily down the hall to breakfast, tired and achy from their sleepless night. They sat around the table where they had eaten cake on their first morning oh, excuse me at their on their first morning at the house and picked listlessly at their food for the first time since their arrival at uncle monty's they were not eager to enter the reptile room and begin the day's work i suppose we have to go in now violet said finally putting aside her scarcely nibbled toast i'm sure uncle monty has already started working and is expecting us and i'm sure that stefano is there too klaus said staring glumly into his cereal bowl. We'll never get a chance to tell Uncle Monty what we, what we know about him. Yinga, Sunny said sadly, dropping her untouched raw carrot onto the floor. If only Uncle Monty knew what we knew, Violet said, and Stefano knew that he knew what we knew. But Uncle Monty doesn't know what we know, and Stefano knows that he doesn't know what we know. I know, Klaus said. I know you know, Violet said, but what we don't know is what... Count Olaf, I mean, Stefano is really up to. He's after our fortune, certainly. But how can he get it if we're uncle, under Uncle Monty's care? 
Maybe he's just going to wait until we're of age and then steal the fortune, Klaus said. Four years is a long time to wait, Violet said. The three orphans were quiet, as each remembered where they had been four years ago. Violet had been ten and wore, and had worn her hair very short. She remembered that sometime around her tenth birthday she had invented a new kind of pencil sharpener. Klaus had been about eight, and he remembered how interested he had been in, co in comment comets, reading all of the astronomy books his parents had in their library. Sunny, of course, had not been born four years ago, and she sat and tried to remember what that was like. Very dark, she thought, with nothing to bite. For all three youngsters, four years did seem like a very long time. Come on, come on, you are moving very slowly this morning, Uncle Monty said, bursting into the room. His face seemed even brighter than usual, and he was holding a small bunch of folded papers in what he had. Stefano ha has only worked here one day, and he's already in the reptile room. In fact, he was up before I was. I ran into him on my way down the stairs. He's an eager beaver, but you three, you're moving like a Hungarian sloth snake whose top speed is half an inch per hour. We have lots to do today, and I'd like to catch the six o'clock showing of zombies in the snow tonight. So let's try to hurry, hurry, hurry. Violet looked at Uncle Monty and realized that this might be their only opportunity to talk to him alone without Stefano around. But he seemed so wound up. They weren't sure if he was, would even listen to them. Speaking of Stefano, she said timidly, we'd like to talk to you about him. Uncle Monty's eyes widened, and he looked around him as if there were spies in the room before leaning in to whisper to the children. I'd like to talk to you too, he said. I have my suspicions about Stefano, and I'd like to discuss them with you. The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another in relief. You do? Klaus said. Of course, Uncle Maud, you said. Last night I began to get very suspicious about this new assistant of mine. There's something a little spooky about him, and I... Uncle Monty looked around again and then began speaking even softer, so the children had to hold their breaths to hear him. And I think we should discuss this outside, shall we? The children nodded in agreement and rose from the table, leaving their dirty, di dirty breakfast dishes behind, which is not a good thing to do in general, but perfectly acceptable in the face of an emergency. They walked with Uncle Monty to the front entryway, passing the painting of the two snakes intertwined together, out the front door and onto the lawn, as if they wanted to walk, talk to the snake-shaped hedges instead of one another. "'I don't mean to be vainglorious,' Uncle Monty began." using the word here, which means braggy, but I really am one of the most widely respected herpetologists in the world. Klaus blinked. It was an unexpected beginning for the conversation. Of course you are, he said, but, and because of this, I'm sad to say, Uncle Monty continued, as if he had not heard, as if he had not heard, many people are jealous of me. I'm sure that's true, Violet said, puzzled. And when people are jealous, Uncle Monty said, shaking his head, they will do anything. They will do crazy things. When I was getting my herbit herbitology degree, my roommate was so envious of the new toad I had discovered that he stole and ate my only specimen. I had to x-ray his stomach and use the x-ray rather than the toad in my presentation. And something tells me we may have a similar situation here. What was Uncle Monty talking about? I'm afraid I don't quite follow you, Klaus said, which is a polite way of saying, what are you talking about, Uncle Monty? Last night, after you went to bed, Stefano asked me a few too many questions about all the snakes and about the upcoming expedition. And do you know why? I think so, Violet began, but Uncle Monty interrupted her. It is because this man, who is calling himself Stefano, he said, is really a member of the Herpetological Society, and he is here to try and find the incredibly deadly viper so he can present my presentation do you three know what the word or so he can preempt my presentation do you know what the word preempt means no violet said but it means that i think this stefano is going to steal my snake uncle monty said and present it to the herpetological society because it is a new species there's no way i can prove i discovered it before we know it, the incredibly deadly viper will be called the Stefano snake, or something dreadful like that. 
And if he's planning that, just think what he will do to our Peruvian expedition. Each toad we catch, each venom sample we put in a test tube, each snake interview we record, every scrap of work we do will fall into the hands of this Herpetological Society spy. He's not a Herpetological Society spy, Klaus said impatiently. He's Count Olaf. I know just what you mean, Uncle Monty said excitedly. This sort of behavior is indeed as dastardly as the ter as that terrible man's that is why i'm go i am doing this he raised one hand and waved the folded papers in the air as you know he said tomorrow we are leaving for peru these are our tickets for the five o'clock voyage on the prospero a fine ship that will take us across the sea to south america there's a ticket for me one for violet one for klaus and one for stefano but not one for sunny because we're going to hide her in a suitcase to save money. Depot! I'm just kidding. But I'm not kidding about this. Uncle, Mo Uncle Monty, his face flushed with excitement, took one of the folded papers and began ripping it into tiny pieces. This is Stefano's ticket. He is not going to Peru with us, after all. Tomorrow, mo tomorrow morning, I'm going to tell him that w he needs to stay here and look after my specimens instead. That way, we can run a successful expedition in peace. But Uncle Monty, Klaus said, how many times must I remind you it's not polite to interrupt? Uncle Monty interrupted, shaking his head. In any case, I know what you're worried about. You're worried what will happen if he stays here alone with the incredibly deadly viper. But don't worry, the viper will join us on the expedition, traveling in one of our snake carrying cases. I don't know why you're looking so glum, Sonny. I thought you'd be happy to have the viper's company. So don't look so worried, Bambini. As you can see, your Uncle Monty has the situation in, in hand. When someone is a little bit wrong, say when a waiter puts non-fat milk in your espresso macchiato instead of low-fat milk, it is often, often quite easy to explain to them how and why they were wrong. But if someone is surpassingly wrong, say when a waiter bites your nose instead of taking your order, order you can often be so surprised that you're unable to say anything at all. Paralyzed by how wrong the waiter is, your mouth would hang slightly open and your eyes would blink over and over, but you would be unable to say a word. This is what the Baudelaire children did. Uncle Monty was so wrong about Stefano, in thinking he was a herpetological spy rather than Count Olaf, that the three siblings could scarcely think of a way to tell him so. Come now, my dears, Uncle Monty said. We've wasted enough time, enough of the morning, on talk. We have to, ow, he interrupted himself with a cry of surprise and pain and fell to the ground. Uncle Monty, Klaus cried. The Baudelaire children saw a large shiny object was on top of him and realized a moment later that the object was what the object was. It was the heavy brass reading lamp, the one standing next to the large cushioned chair in Klaus's room. Ow, Uncle Monty said again, pulling the lamp off him. That really hurt. My shoulder may be sprained. It's a good thing I did, it didn't land on my head, or it might really have done some damage. But where did it come from? Violet asked. It must have fallen from the window, Uncle Monty said, pointing up to where Klaus's room was. Whose room is that? Klaus, I believe it's yours. You must be more careful. You can't dangle heavy objects out the window like that. Look, what almost happened? But that lamp wasn't anywhere near my window, Klaus said. I keep it in my alcove so I can read in, in the large chair. Really, Klaus? Uncle Monty said, standing up and handing him the lamp. Do you honestly expect me to believe that the lamp danced over to the window and leaped onto my shoulder? Please, put this back in your room in a safe place and we'll say no more about it. But, Klaus said, but his older sister interrupted him. I'll help you, Klaus, Violet said. We'll find a place where it's, for it where it's safe. Well, don't be too long, Uncle Monty said, rubbing his shoulder. We'll see you in the reptile room. Come, Sonny. Walking through the entry hall, the four parted ways at the stairs, with Uncle Monty and Sonny going to the enormous stores of the reptile room, and Violet and Klaus carrying the heavy brass lamp up to Klaus's room. You know very well, Klaus hissed to his sister, that I was not careless with this lamp. Of course I know that, Violet whispered, but there is no use trying to explain that to Uncle Monty. He thinks Stefano is a herpetological spy. You know as well as I do that Stefano was responsible for this. 
How clever you are to figure that out, said a voice at the top of the stairs, and Violet and Klaus were so surprised that they almost dropped the lamp. It was Stefano, or, if you prefer, it was Count Olaf. It was the bad guy. But then you've always been clever children, he continued. A little too clever for my taste, but you won't be around for long, so I'm not too troubled by it. You're not very clever yourself, Klaus said fiercely. This heavy brass lamp almost hit us, but if, if anything happens to my sister or me, you'll never get your hands on the Baudelaire fortune. Oh, dear me, dear me, Stefano said, his grimy teeth showing as, as he smiled. If I wanted to harm you, orphan, your blood would already be pouring down these stairs like a waterfall. No, I'm not going to harm a hair on any Baudelaire head. Not here in this house. You needn't be afraid of me, little ones, until we find ourselves in a location where crimes are more difficult to trace. And where would that be, Violet asked. We plan to stay right here until we grow up. Really, Stefano said in a sneaky, sneaky voice. Why, I had the impression we were leaving the country tomorrow. Uncle Monty tore up your ticket, Klaus rep replied triumphantly. He was suspicious of you, and he changed his plans and now you're not going with us. Stefano's smile turned into a scowl, and his stained teeth seemed to grow bigger. His eyes grew sh so shiny that it hurt Violet and Klaus to look at them. I wouldn't rely on that, he said in a terrible, terrible voice. Even the best plans can change if there's an accident. He pointed one spiky finger at the brass reading lamp. And accidents happen all the time. Chapter 6 Bad circumstances have a way of ruining things that would otherwise be pleasant. So it was with the Baudelaire orphans in the movie Zombies in the Snow. All afternoon the three children had sat and worried in the reptile room under the mocking stare of Stefano and the, uh, and the oblivious. The word oblivious here means not aware that Stefano was really Count Olaf and thus being in a great deal of danger. Chatter of Uncle Monty so by the time it was evening, the siblings were in no mood for cinematic entertainment. Uncle Monty's Jeep was really too small to hold him, Stefano, and the three orphans, so Klaus and Violet shared a seat and poor Sonny had to sit on Stefano's filthy lap. But the Baudelaire's were too preoccupied to even notice this discomfort. The children sat all in a row at the, at the multiplex, with Aunt Uncle Monty on one side while Stefano sat in the middle and hogged the popcorn. But the children were too anxious to eat any snacks and too busy trying to figure out what Stefano planned to do to enjoy Zombies in the Snow, which is a fine film. When the zombies first rose out of the snowbanks surrounding the tiny alpine fishing village, Violet tried to imagine a way in which Stefano could get aboard the Prospero without a ticket and accompany them to Peru. Peru. When the town fathers constructed a barrier of sturdy oak, only to have the zombies chomp their way through it, Klaus was concerned with exactly what Stefano had meant when he spoke about accidents. And when Gerda the little milkmaid made friends with the zombies and asked them to please stop eating the villagers, Sonny, who was of course scarcely old enough to comprehend the orphan situation, tried to think up a way to defeat Stefano's plans, whatever they were. In the final scene of the movie, the zombies and the villagers celebrated May Day together. But the three Baudelaire orphans were too nervous and afraid to enjoy themselves one bit. On the way home, Uncle Monty tried to talk to the si tried to talk to the silent, worried children sitting in the back, but they hardly said a word in reply, and eventually he fell silent. When the jeep pulled up to the snake-shaped hedges, the Baudelaire children dashed out and ran to the front door without even saying good night to their puzzled guardian. With heavy hearts, they climbed the stairs to their bedrooms. But when they reached their door, they could not bear to part. Could we all spend the night in the same room? Klaus asked Violet timidly. Last night I felt as if I were in a jail cell, wor worrying all by myself. Me too, Violet admitted. Since we're not going to sleep, we might as well not sleep in the same place. Tico, Sunny agreed, and followed her siblings into Violet's room. Violet looked around the bedroom and remembered how excited she had been to move into it just a short while ago. Now the enormous window with the views of the snake-shaped hedges seemed depressing rather than inspiring, and the blank pages tacked to her wall rather than being convenient, 
convenient, seemed only to remind her of how anxious she was. "'I see you haven't worked much on your inventions,' Klaus said gently. "'I haven't been reading at all. "'When Count Olaf is around, it sure puts a damper on the imagination.' Not always, Violet pointed out. When we lived with him, you read all about nuptial law to find out about his plan, and I invented a grappling hook to put a stop to it. In this situation, though, Klaus said glumly, we don't even know what Count Olaf is up to. How can we formulate a plan if we don't know his plan? Well, let's try to hash this out, Violet said, using an expression which here means talk about something at length until we completely understand it. Count Olaf, calling himself Stefano, has come to this house in disguise and is obviously after the Baudelaire fortune. And, Klaus continued, once he gets his hands on it, he plans to kill us. Tadu, Sonny murmured solemnly, which probably meant something along the lines of, it's a loathsome situation in which we find ourselves. However, Violet said, if he harms us, there's no way he can get our fortune. That's why he tried to marry me last time. Thank God that didn't work, Klaus said, shivering. Then Count Olaf would be my brother-in-law. But this time, he's not planning to marry you. He said something about an accident. And about heading to a location where crimes were more difficult to trace, Violet said, remembering his words. That must mean Peru. But Stefano isn't going to Peru. Uncle Machi tore up his ticket. Duke, Sunny shrieked in a generic cry of frustration and pounded her little fist on the floor. The word generic here means when one is unable to think of anything else to say. And Sunny was not alone in this. Violet and Klaus were, of course, too old to say things like Doog, but they wished they weren't. They wished they could figure out Count Olaf's plan. They wished their situation didn't seem as mysterious and hopeless as it did. And they wished they were young enough to simply shriek Doog and pound their fists on the floor. And most of all, of course, they wished that their parents were alive and that the Baudelaire's were all safe in the home where they had been born. And as fervently as the Baudelaire orphans wished their circumstances were different, I wish that I could somehow change the circumstances of this story for you. Even as I sit here, safe as can be, and so very far from Count Olaf, I can scarcely bear to write another word. Perhaps it would be best if you shut this book right now and never read the rest of this horrible story. You can imagine, if you wish, that an hour later the Baudelaire orphan suddenly figured out what Stefano was up to and were able to save Uncle Monty's life. You can picture the police arriving with all their flashing lights and sirens and dragging Stefano away to jail for the rest of his life. You can pretend, even though it is not so, that the Baudelaire's are living happily with Uncle Monty to this day. Or, best of all, you can conjure up the illusion that the Baudelaire parents have not been killed, and that the terrible fire and Count Olaf and Uncle Monty and all the other unfortunate events are nothing more than a dream, a figment of the imagination. But this story is not a happy one. And I am not happy to tell you that the Baudelaire orphans sat dumbly in Violet's room. The word dumbly here means without speaking, rather than in a stupid way. For the rest of the night, had someone peeped through the bedroom window as the morning sun rose, they would have seen the three children huddled together on the bed, their eyes wide open and dark with worry. But nobody peeped through the window. Somebody knocked on the door. Four loud knocks, as if something was being nailed shut. The children blinked and looked at one another. Who is it? Klaus called out, his voice crackly from being silent so long. Instead of an answer, whoever it was simply turned the knob and the door swung slowly open. There stood Stefano with his clothes all rumpled and his eyes shining brighter than they ever had before. Good morning, he said. It's time to leave for Peru. There is just room for three orphans and myself in the jeep, so get a move on. We told you yesterday that you weren't going, Violet said. She hoped her voice sounded braver than she felt. It is your, it is your Uncle Monty who isn't going, Stefano said, and raised the part of his forehead where his eyebrows should have been. Don't be ridiculous, Klaus said. Uncle Monty wouldn't miss this expedition for the world. Ask him, Stefano said and the Baudelaire saw a familiar expression on his face. His mouth scarcely moved, but his eyes were shining as if he had just told a joke. Why don't you ask him? He's down in the reptile room. 
We will ask him, Violet said. Uncle Monty has no intention of letting you take us to Peru alone. She rose from the bed and took the hands of her siblings and walked quickly past Stefano, who was smirking in the doorway. We will ask him, Violet said again, and Stefano gave a little bow as the children walked out of the room. The hallway was strangely quiet and the blank eyes and blank as the eyes of a skull. Uncle Monty? Violet called at the end of the hallway. Nobody answered. Aside from the few creaks of, on the steps, the whole house was eerily quiet, as if it had been deserted for many years. Uncle Monty, Klaus called at the bottom of the stairs. They heard nothing. Standing on tiptoe, Violet opened the enormous door of the reptile room, and for a moment the orphan stared into the room as if hypnotized, entranced by the odd blue light which the sunrise made as it shone through the glass ceiling and walls. In the dim glow, they could see only silhouettes of the various reptiles as they moved around in their cages, or slept curled in the shapeless dark masses. Their footsteps echoed off the glimmering walls, and the three siblings walked through the reptile room towards the far end, where Uncle Monty's library lay waiting for them. Even through the dark, even though the dark room felt mysterious and strange, it was, comf it was a comforting mystery and a safe strangeness. They remembered Uncle Monty's promise that if they took their time to learn the facts, no harm would come to them here in the reptile room. However, you and I remember that Uncle Monty's promise was laden with dramatic irony. And now, here in the early morning gloom of the reptile room, that irony was going to come to fruition. A phrase which here means the Baudelaire's were finally going to learn of it. For just as they reached the books and the three siblings could see a large shadowy mass huddled in the far, far corner, nervously Klaus switched on one of the reading lights to get a better look. The shadowy mass was Uncle Monty. His mouth was slightly agape, as if he were surprised, and his eyes were wide open, but he didn't appear to see them. His face, usually so rosy, was very, very, very pale, and under his left eye were two small holes, right in line, the sort of mark made by two fangs of a snake. Tivo soon? Sonny asked, and tugged at his pants leg. Uncle Monty did not move. As he had promised, no harm had come to the Baudelaire orphans in the reptile room, but great harm had come to Uncle Monty. That is the end of chapter six, so we'll read seven and eight next time.